so now we have talked the talked about the positive agent of the gas gangrene as well as the pathogenesis of the gas gangrene so we will now go for the lab diagnosis of the gas gangrene so see here the diagnosis in case of gas gangrene is just for confirmation of diagnosis okay you you diagnose gas gangrene just clinically okay you need not a lab diagnosis for uh, diagnose a laboratory for diagnosing uh, gas gangrene you can see the crepitus you diagnose the gas gangrene simple with a history of uh, road traffic accident so you need not have you need not to bother about the lab diagnosis so why do we do this lab diagnosis this is just to confirm the microorganisms which are causing the uh, that uh, you, you know you which are causing that uh, gas gangrene there so it is just to confirm to confirm the diagnosis and to identify the species so that specific antibiotics can be given so this is one case where you diagnose the case with uh, your clinical ability and there is one more case that is diphtheria where you diagnose with the clinical uh, diagnose with your clinical skills not with the lab diagnosis so in case of gas gangrene as well as in case of the diphtheria the lab diagnosis is just for confirmation but the diagnosis is at the point at this uh, at the site you see the case and uh, the treatment is started immediately without waiting for the lab diagnosis in both these cases so here to diagnose these or to confirm the diagnosis of the gas gangrene you have to first collect the specimen you have to first collect the specimen what are the specimens that one should collect so the specimen that should be collect are the exudates from the exudates from the deeper parts where the active infection is seen so you should not collect the exudate just from the upper part of the wound you should go deeper inside the infection and then collect the exudate from there and also one should collect the necrotic tissues as well as the muscle fragments now how many swabs should be collected so total three swabs should be collected okay total three swabs should be collected uh, what is the need of three swabs so three out of those three the one is one is for direct detection by smear and other one is for aerobic culture and the third one is for the anaerobic culture so that's why we use three swabs to collect the specimen from the deeper parts of the infection where the infection is active next is the transport of a specimen transport again becomes very important here because any exposure to air will kill the will uh, kill the microorganism because you know that the clostridia are the obligate anaerobes so they cannot grow in presence of o2 any exposure to o2 will kill them so that's why uh, they, the transport here becomes very important so they should be transported in the robertson cooked meat broad media which is a anaerobic media okay now we know that the clostridium perfringens are sacrolytic in nature they utilizes the saccharides of the tissues not the proteins so as they are sacrolytic that's why they convert the meat particles into pink or the bright red color okay in, into the pink or the bright, bright red color how can you remember that you know the name clostridium perfringens clostridium perfringens p for pink so they convert the uh, uh, meat particles into pink or the bright red by that you can remember that clostridium perfringens are sacrolytic clostridium perfringens clostridium pink okay perfringens for pink now once you transport the specimen to the laboratory safely into the robertson cooked broad media or any other anaerobic media then you have to do the direct detection so for direct detection you have got one special swab there and with that swab you gram staining uh, you it produces a smear on a, a glass slide and then you gram stain the uh, smear and under microscopy you can see these three types of bacteria can be seen one is the box car sepid gram positive bacteria without spore if that is uh, that is the case there is a box car sepid gram positive bacilli without spore then it is clostridium perfringens but if it is leaf sepid gram positive bacteria with spores then it is clostridium septicum and if it is rod sepid gram positive bacteria with spore then it will be clostridium novi so this should be remembered these are the characteristic on this bacteria this would be remembered about the individual bacteria that is clostridium perfringens septicum and the no way this would must be 
remember now if we go to the culture uh, how do we call uh, do the culture of that so in the culture we have got the following medias that is blood agar with neomycin anaerobic media and then the pills and hops lactose egg yolk milk media these are the two media that we use for culturing this anaerobic microorganisms and what is the colony characteristic so in the anaerobic blood agar with neomycin the clostridium perfringens produces the target hemolysis again this becomes a very important mcq that target hemolysis is produced by the clostridium perfringens what is the meaning of the target hemolysis we will see later but for the time being you should know that the clostridium perfringens produces the target hemolysis on the anaerobic blood agar with neomycin why do we use neomycin into the culture media to prevent any other bacterial growth that is an antibiotic okay so now coming to the what is the meaning of the target hemolysis so the meaning of the target hemolysis is that uh, suppose this is the blood agar okay and this is a site of inoculation here inside the inside inside the uh, cent at the center there is inoculation of the bacteria so you see that there is a inner zone there is an inner zone this is small area this inner zone is the is the zone of complete hemolysis and this is caused by theta toxin while this outer outer zone around the complete hemolysis the outer zone is of is zone of incomplete hemolysis and that is produced by the alpha toxin okay so when you see this two different colors will be seen in in the uh, inner 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 complete hemolysis zone and the outer uh, incomplete hemolysis zone two different colors will be seen so that will appear as if a, as if there is a target okay that will appear as if a target is there so that's why it is called as target hemolysis okay so and you should remember that the complete hemolysis is by the alpha toxin uh, sorry by the theta toxin and incomplete hemolysis is by the alpha toxin this should be remembered and this is the characteristic hemolysis seen with the clostridium perfringens next is the wills and hops lactose egg yolk milk media so uh, on this media this uh, media contains lactose you can see by the name of the media itself it contains egg yolk and it contains milk so it contains three things okay so it causes following changes in the media first thing is that it causes pink growth why is that so that is because of the lactose fermentation because if they are sacrolytic so they ferment the lactose and they cause the ph changes and that's why uh, there is pink growth on this wheels and hops lactose egg yolk milk media then they cause the formation of zone of opacity this is due to the lecithinase activity lecithinase activity is by virtue of the alpha uh, toxin produced by the clostridium perfringens so that's why that lecithinase activity due to that lecithinase activity of the alpha toxin there is formation of zone of opacity around the growth of the uh, uh, colonies okay so this is the characteristic findings colony characteristics on the wheels and hops lactose egg yolk milk media now coming to the identifications how can we identify we can identify the simple automated methods like Malditoff and Vitek okay next is the pathogenicity testing so pathogenicity testing is the indirect tests for detection of the uh, pathogenic organism so we here we detect whether the pathogen is really toxic or not and what is the point or what is the feature which provides the to uh, characteristic of toxicity to a pathogen that is its toxin so once we demonstrate the toxin of the pathogen then we can say that this that pathogen is toxin in absence of that toxin the pathogen is you know pathogen is unable to do anything with the human okay suppose if the clostridium perfringens would not have its alpha toxin then it, uh, uh, it would have been able to cause that gas gangrene no it would have not been able to uh, cause that uh, uh, cause that gas gangrene so that gas gangrene is there by virtue of its toxin not by virtue of the bacteria okay so this is the point of pathogenicity testing that we want to demonstrate that whether the toxin is present in that bacteria or not we are not concerned about the bacteria because here the pathogenesis is caused by the toxin itself so that's why we want to demonstrate the toxin and once the toxin is demonstrated we can say that the bacteria is pathogenic or not 
so for that we do the Nagler reaction what is the Nagler reaction Nagler reaction is done to detect the alpha toxins so what do we do in that like Nagler reaction we will see this Nagler reaction separately in a separate video because it is asked as short note uh, in the university exam so we have to see this separately but for the time being when we are writing the lab diagnosis you have to write about it shortly in a short manner so here we will see just the procedure that is on a yog uh, egg yolk agar media or on a media containing 20 percent human serum what do we do we produces a colony of clostridium perfringens we streak it a colony of clostridium perfringens at two places in two halves of the media so suppose if this is the media we convert it into two media and on one half uh, uh, and before making the sticks on one half we add the anti alpha toxin so we add uh, we add the anti alpha toxin here on one half we we just uh, smear the anti alpha toxin on one half okay we smear the alpha anti alpha toxin at one half and, and the other half is left blank we do not do anything on the other half so after this what do we do we produces a streak on both the half here also will produce a streak and here also will produce a streak of the clostridium perfringens so what do we see after that is that on that half which is having no antitoxin opalescent that is zone of opacity is seen around the streak line so zone of opacity zone of opacity will be seen around this uh, streak okay zone of opacity will be seen around that streak but no no opacity is seen surrounding the streak on the other half which is having antitoxin so this is the other half which is having the antitoxin but here but uh, here no antitox no no zone of no zone of opacity is seen no this is not seen here the zone of opacity is not seen there because why is that so because uh, the alpha toxin has been neutralized by the anti alpha toxin which was smeared on that half okay so that is neutralized by that uh, anti alpha toxin that's why we cannot see any zone of opalescent or any zone of opacity in that half of the culture media so that is called as the nagler reaction positive so by that we can derive the inference that the species is pathogenic because it is producing the it is producing this uh, zone of opacity around the streak on that half which is having no which is having no uh, anti alpha toxins so see here i have made the diagram also this is the uh, culture media we have and this is the these are the streaks we have these are the streaks we have on the both the halves and on this half we have added the anti alpha anti alpha toxin is smeared and here no alpha toxin has been inspired that's why we can see the opacification we can see this opacification around the is strict due to the lecithinous activity alpha lecithinous activity of the uh, alpha lecithinous activity of the alpha toxin and this media is nothing but the egg yolk media or a media containing 20 percent human serum so this is the basics of the negative reaction now one more reaction is there that is called as the reverse camp test if you are answering very well in the viva then the examiner may ask you about this reverse camp test so what is that reverse camp test that reverse cam test is nothing but the the similar to the camp test that we have seen in the group b streptococci okay the same camp test is this also uh, that is the christie atkins munch peterson test okay but it is reversed why it is called as reverse we will see shortly so here what do we do we uh, the clostridium perfringens is strict on the blood agar we take a blood agar and we stick the clostridium perfringens okay we strict the clostridium perfringens now the streptococcus agalacti is strict perpendicular to the clostridium perfringens streak okay now next we uh, strict the uh, streptococcus agalacti that is group b streptococcus uh, perpendicular to the streak of the clostridium perfringens and we see after incubating it for one to two days we we two days we see that there is aerocepid hemolysis is seen pointing towards the clostridium perfringens streak so see here we have streaked the we have streaked the clostridium perfringens okay we have streaked the clostridium perfringens and then we have streaked the 
this is the streak of the uh, streptococcus agalacti this is the streak of the streptococcus agalacti and after inoculating we can see this hemolytic zone this hemol aero aerocepid hemolytic zone we can see so this is called as the reverse cam test this is called as cam test whenever there is formation of the aerocepid hemolysis towards the streak by the streptococcus agalacti then it is called as cam test but why it is reverse the for why it is reverse we have first to we have to first see the uh, i mean first see the cam test then we can understand why it is reverse so we know that uh, in the we know that in the cam test what do we do we take a blood agar and then we make a streak of make a streak in the center of the Stepto, uh, Staphylococcus aureus it was not the Streptococcus uh, Clostridium perfumius it was Staphylococcus aureus we make a streak of Staphylococcus aureus and then we and then we make the streak of the Streptococcus acalacti perpendicular to it perpendicular to it and after incubating we see the aerocepid hemolysis so as we see the aerocepid hemolysis that's why it is the uh, this, that's why it is the cam test that is that's why it is the positive cam test but why this is reverse this is reverse because see this is reverse this is reverse because here it has been it has been produced on the streak of the clostridium perfringens clostridium perfringens but here the here the uh, cam test has been produced on the streak of the staphylococcus aureus that's why it is called as the reverse cam test because it is the streak that we are using in this test in this reverse cam test is of clostridium perfringens but in the real cam test what which streak do we use we use the staphylococcus aureus streak okay so you are understanding this concept that's why it is called as the reverse cam test positive okay that is why it is called as the reverse cam test positive so this is the difference between the positive cam test and the positive reverse cam test which is seen with the clostridium perfringens okay so this is all about the this is all about the lab diagnosis of the clostridium perfringens or lab diagnosis of the gas gangrene for the uh, and of course you can here also do the uh, micro uh, sorry the you know the molecular methods you can use the pcr and all for detection and also you can do the antimicrobial susceptibility testing for diagnosing or for uh, detecting the resistance of these bacteria against the antibiotics and by that you can uh, get to know about what what is the uh, antibiotic which can be used in that particular patient okay so this is all about the lab diagnosis of the gas gangrene next we will see the third part of the lab uh, third part of the gas gangrene we will where we will see the uh, individually about the Nagler reaction which is sometimes asked as short note in the university exams.